the occasion of this one-of-a-kind Christmas Day celebration, we reflect on some of the biggest and most thorny issues in the nation's polity, all from a different perspective. A very Merry Christmas to you and welcome to Politics Today. I'm Kaido Kikulu. In the spirit of the season, tonight's program is a Christmas special. So get comfortable and let's have a robust conversation for the next half hour or thereabouts. Well, today is a day Christians celebrate the arrival of God himself through the birth of Jesus Christ under the most unusual circumstances. And that's a reminder that great things can come from seemingly unpleasant situations. Well, for Nigeria, that is very relatable because amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, economic recession, rise in inflation, the big one, insecurity, and so much more, we still know deep down that good things can and will come out of Nigeria. Well, it's the ray of hope that keeps us going because when you think about it, really, you ask, is this the best Nigeria can be? Certainly not. And like I said, it is a different approach we're taking on the program this evening. And as we look at those big issues that concern us, yet again, be comfortable. That's in a moment. But first, a look at some of the Christmas messages from heads of government at various levels. Well, President Muhammad Buhari is asking Christians to latch onto the hope that comes with the Christmas celebration and reinvest trust in his administration's determination to restore peace, security and prosperity to the country. For the president, joy, peace, hope, love, goodwill, and imminent salvation are worthy values which Jesus' advent symbolizes. He adds that these are the values needed in our country at this time when we are confronted with diverse challenges like rise in spate of armed banditry, kidnappings, insurgency, economic recession, and upsurge of COVID-19 infections. Well, state governors across the country also put out Christmas messages from Imo to Kaduna, Akwaibom, Ogun State, and all over the country. The message is the same, that we imbibe those virtues of the birth of Jesus Christ, who is the reason for the season. But just how can we do that? Well, let's find out. Archbishop Emeritus John Cardinal Onoyekon joins us on the program tonight to discuss this issue. It's an honor to have you, Your Eminence. Good evening. Oh, well, let me begin by saying Merry Christmas. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I know that this is the second Christmas. Started. Yes, we have started, actually. I, I know that this is the second Christmas after your retirement. And I'm tempted to ask you if you miss the whole active clergy service. But let me try to recoin this. How did you spend your Christmas and with what congregation? Well, okay, it's good you rephrased it. Because even though I'm a retired archbishop, I am still an archbishop, and an archbishop emeritus of uh, Abuja. I have not retired from my priestly duties, so I have continued to be busy uh, uh, leading congregations, even though I do not uh, control administration of any of the diocese. I'm also, I'm also working hand in hand with the, my successor, the present Archbishop of Abuja, His Grace Ignatius Kai, Kaigama. We are working very well together. I, su I support him and help him in the heavy task that he has, not only in the fact that he's taking over in a new way a diocese that has its own complexities, but doing so at a time like this with the challenges of COVID-19. To answer your question directly, uh, I, I live in Asokoro, and somehow I consider myself a member of the Asokoro Catholic Parish of the Assumption. And so that is where I went this last night for our usual Catholic Christmas Midnight Mass. Midnight Mass, which we started actually at 10 o'clock. The, there was a congregation there that has always come, even under the COVID uh, uh, situation, 
observing the COVID protocols. And in Asukuru, I must say, they are very meticulous about this. We started our mass at 10, but by 11.15, we were done. And we wished each other a happy Christmas. Then, today, this afternoon, I had the joy of celebrating a, a holy mass with a church full of children who had been brought together by a good friend of ours, a good daughter of our church, uh, Dame, Dr. Dame uh, Adaura Umeoji, who is a high official of the Zenith Bank. She has been, she has had the, this, uh, uh, this um, uh, habit of bringing children together in her house in Achokuru. And Clearly, the numbers you, you were getting far from more and more numerous. Right, pardon me. Clearly, you still had a very, very busy day. But let me just... So, uh, the, but after finishing the Mass, I will tell you, after Mass, right. we went, I went then from... I said the Mass in Kuje, our Catholic uh, Junior Seminary, and then I went to the prison, which is what I normally do every Christmas afternoon, mm -hmm. to visit the prisoners and to share the joy of Christmas with them, except that this year we were two archbishops there because my successor, Archbishop Kaigama was there already before I arrived there. They were very happy. Again, here, we observed all the necessary precautions to prevent unnecessary spread of the COVID-19. Instead of the huge crowd that we used to go with, we were limited to a small group of about 25 to 30 visitors. Okay, but you know, Your Eminence, it's the not every inmates day. Were there. It's not every day we have you on the program and there are quite a, a number of issues to, to, to get you to, you know, speak on. So uh, let me first ask you, I mean, you've talked about how your day went and clearly a lot of Nigerians spend their day going to churches and, you know, spending time with other fellow worshippers. But Nigeria is one of the most religious countries in the world. In fact, you find either a church or a mosque or both in every other street across the country, but yet we're still faced with challenges on different fronts. So why is it that we're still faced with these challenges and vices in spite of the teachings of these religions? Uh, well, it depends on what challenges you are talking about. Uh, for as long as we are in this life with the flesh that we all carry, with the with the influence of the evil one that constantly tries to uh, take us away from the right path, we will always find, find the necessity to ask for God's help and assistance so that human beings might live in a better way. And the problems and the challenges you are referring to, I, wonder, I imagine you mean the moral, ethical challenges that bedevil us, has been there from time immemorial and I dare say, it will be there until the end of time. That does not render religion and religious practices irrelevant. On the contrary, it, it, will, it indicates the need for such religious practices. We who live by religion know very well that uh, uh, we rely on God for whatever little effort we are able to make to live an honest and uh, decent life. We also realize that if you don't have any faith in God, you must have a faith in something. Otherwise, if it is a matter of do whatever you like or whatever you can, then this world of ours will be impossible to live in. Um, there is the fact of the relevance of religion. No matter what... Uh, uh, many people may say about whether it is relevant or not. It is clear and uh, scientifically proven that more than 80% of the inhabitants of our planet believe firmly that for them religion is important. Now, uh, if you are a scientist, you must look at the facts. And I believe that uh, for us it is more than scientific fact. It is what we believe is really what God has done. God created us. We are not just an animals that happen to be walking on two legs. We are human beings created in the image and likeness of God. So there's a whole spiritual dimension of our existence 
both as individuals and as society, right. which ordinary social political structures cannot adequately handle. There is a lot to say in this regard, but clearly. maybe if you continue your questioning, we might, I might be able to be more specific if okay. you want more explanation. Well, if you take a look at my questions, there are quite a number of them and, you know, we're pressed for time. So let me just move into another issue, which is related, actually, because you talked about those vices. And when I mean vices, I listed them earlier. Corruption. Unfortunately, I don't have your list of questions. So I'm going to try to give you some of them, which I'm trying to do Go now. Go ahead, anyway. So we have uh, insecurity. <laughs> we have corruption. There's an economic challenge. And, you know, COVID-19, we just joined us this year. We've been 60 years on this journey since independence. And for Nigeria, this diamond celebration is christened togetherness. Let me just get your opinion quickly on this, uh, the theme of our celebration, togetherness. Looking at Nigeria as it is right now, just on what part of that continuum of togetherness are we? Because I know you made a statement that Nigeria might break in 2023. So on what part of that continuum of togetherness are we right now? Um, it is not an easy question to answer. What I will say is that if, one was, if we want to be sincere with ourselves, we must admit that we need to be careful to watch out and to try and uh, reduce the amount of, uh, of division among us, the amount of uh, rancor that we promote among ourselves, and especially those who claim to be leaders that we need less of uh, tribal gladiators and more and more national leaders. Um, I am now 77 years old. I have seen Nigeria well before 1960. And I'm sorry to say that in terms of national cohesion, we have not made as much progress as I had expected when I left school in 1963. Uh, where we have, it has been more or less a case of two steps forward and one step on three steps backwards. We've had all kinds of events that have uh, uh, impacted us rather negatively in terms of national cohesion. And we, the, maybe what we should congratulate ourselves with is that despite all these challenges, we have managed to keep together somehow. But we cannot continue to count on being lucky, dancing on the brink of chaos. We must de definitely make it a point of, uh, a point of uh, concern that we want to be together, believe in the importance of our unity, believe that it is better for Nigeria to be one united nation than that we separate ourselves into little bits and pieces. That basic conviction has to be stressed day in, day out. And I'm afraid those who should be stressing it more are the leaders, political leaders and other uh, elite leaders. They should do that more than, the, than we are seeing, uh, whether it's on the political level, even religious level. I am a cardinal, so I believe I know what Christianity is all about. Christianity is not about the division of humanity. And I can be, a, I am, and I hope I am a good Catholic. That does not mean I should have no room in my mind for others who may have a different religious positions. If all of us can agree to that, then we can, we can live together in peace, mm. have a, a, a sufficient level of unity to be able to carry our united action for right. a nation where we can live together as a family with different members. Well, your I eminence. Say family, because even in a family, the uh, members are not all the same. Your eminence, a lot of Nigerians will know you as someone who speaks truth to power time and again. We'll need to go on a quick break now. And when we return, we'll try as much as possible to do that in specific areas. So please stay with us.
So welcome back to the program. Let's rejoin Archbishop Emeritus John Cardinal Lonoyekan, who joins us from our Abuja studio tonight on this Christmas Day special. Thank you so much for your patience, your eminence. Well, we're going to speak truth to power, as you always do, specifically speaking now. And, I mean, looking at President Buhari's Christmas message to Nigerians, he's asking that Nigerians reinvest trust in his administration's determination to restore peace, security, and prosperity to the country, clearly indicating or admitting that there's a trust deficit. But you know people say that trust is earned. So what does this administration need to do to get people's trust? Thank you very much. Let me start with your point of departure that I am known to speak truth to power. Uh, well, I don't expect to be specially congratulated for that since that is what a prophet is all about. That's what a religious leader should do, should speak truth to power, especially a religious leader who has no ambition to take power. All we do is to help, to help our nation by help, helping our leaders with good advice so that they can, adv they can operate and do their work following the truth, and the truth only will make us free. To come to your question about, <laughs> unfortunately, having been busy the whole day uh, on pastoral activities, I have not had the opportunity to listen to the President's Christmas message, so I only heard what you have said now. First of all, I must say it is positive that he recognizes that his government has a trust deficit uh, um, the liability, a heavy liability of trust deficit. And it is not good for a nation that the citizens cannot trust their government. So that even when the government is trying to do the right thing, there is always this, this, idea, this feeling where let us wait and see, maybe is one of those things again. Now, which means uh, to speak truth to power, our government must take a look at its, its uh, modus operandi, its way of, of operation up till now. They ought to be able to know why is it that they have a trust deficit? Why is it that people don't seem to want to trust them? If you ask me, basically, you trust somebody who is truthful. But if you have too many cases of government saying one thing and not and doing perhaps another, then there is a, there's a, the, the recipe for a, tr a trust deficit. We have heard a lot said about fake news, about uh, uh, decept massive deceit. This is not correct. And if, for example, which is quite well known, if we are, we are told, for example, I'm just giving a clear example, that, uh, oh, the Boko Haram has been uh, uh, defeated. That was four years ago. And they are still on. Then people will ask, what, do you mean? what did you mean? Were you serious? So that any time again there's an another announcement on Boko Haram, people are likely to say, we wait and see until we are really sure. Now, which means... We have a task before us, and the government ought to take that seriously. And all those who speak on behalf of government should believe in the sacredness of the truth. We, we, we have, Nigerians are ready to, ask, to listen to the truth. But when they are consistently deceived, mm. it, is not, it is neither good for the government nor good for the governed. Well, and speaking I of... Think here, we need... To, Everybody needs to do uh, uh, a con an examination of conscience. Uh, and that, I throw the ball therefore back at not only President Buhari himself, but all those who are with him uh, running the affairs of this nation. Well, let's we'll quickly talk security. We'll be really happy to right. have a government we trust. Mm. Let's quickly talk security because I know you're part of the Nigeria Working Group on Peace Building and uh, Governance. And you try to advance ideas for the Nigerian government to address violence. And you give suggestions, basically. But the question I'd like to ask is, uh, I know you advise government. 
Does government take those advice that you have given? Do they take them on board? The way you put this question, Nigerians will think that I belong to a little, uh, a little think tank that uh, uh, has a clear, uh, maybe a clear channel of uh, s sending advice to the government. I'm afraid I don't know of any such participation of myself in any such group. All I can say is that most of the advice I give to government is generally when people like you ask me questions on the media and I speak my mind. Or when I'm on the pulpit and I speak to my people who are listening to me. <clears throat> but as for um, a, a group that will, be, uh, that will advise government on crucial issues, I wish there was one. And if there was one, I wish I'm a member. Then I will be able to make my mind no, clear. So for the moment, uh, all I keep, all we do say, all I, I say clearly is, the, we should not be living in a nation that we, in which we are not secure. We should not be living in a Nigeria where I cannot travel from Abuja to, to Kaduna without my heart missing 10 beats. I should be able to take my car and drive to my town in Kaba without fear of being hijacked on the way. And the fact that we are not safe is clear. Those of them who are high up in government know under what condition they travel around, if they ever travel by road. They travel with a, with a, a, a battalion, no, not a battalion, a, a, certainly a, an escort of armed people. How many Nigerians can go around with escorts? Until Nigerians can move around without escorts, we are not safe. So maybe we should start from there. On a final note, uh, you've spoken about the NSARS protest. And for a lot of people, they thought it gave us an opportunity to hit the reset button. Because a lot of young Nigerians came out to speak against social vices. The question is, do you think we took advantage of that opportunity well enough? Are you referring now to the famous end SARS The end SARS protests, right. Well, the, the, we were told at the height of the end SARS protests that uh, the government had heard the complaints and the protests of the young people. Our president said very clearly that we heard you loud and clear and we have taken note which was good music in our eye, in our ears. Now, after that, has anything drastically changed? Your answer is as good as mine, unless maybe there are still people, there are people still trying to work out what to do, how to change things. Before then, however, the change cannot happen until people change. People must change their attitude, they must change their priorities, they must change their moral orientation, and that is not easy. It is not easy, but it has to be done if we are to move forward peacefully. If we are not to uh, bring ourselves to a point, a tipping point where the situation just can no longer hold. We need a country where even if, the, even if we need drastic change, let the changes be done in a peaceful way because mm -hmm. that is always the best. Now, to change peacefully, we must start by changing ourselves right. in, 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 many, in many, many ways. And I think we do know what is wrong with ourselves. We do know. Right. We do know. It's just I, I, I that think... we don't have the will. Mm. Sometimes they call it the political will, but I call it the, the moral will to change. Food for thought, really, uh, on a day like this. Archbishop Emeritus John Cardinal Onoyekon would like to thank you so much for taking time out to speak with us, despite your schedule, and we appreciate you very much. Merry Christmas to you. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity on this day. Christmas, happy Christmas to all Nigerians. Well, I believe the God is you with the us. Same. Amen to that. Well, that's our show for tonight, everyone. Many thanks for watching. I am tired of you. Have a Merry Christmas, or what's left of it.